literally last week in our church in Spanish. So it's the first time I've heard it in English in quite a long time. So that was, that was really cool. Um, no, it's really been lovely getting to know everyone. We've been very warmly received this entire weekend and also this morning with all the folks that we've gotten to know so far. Uh, my name is Thomas Kunkel. This is my wife, Sandra. I'll have her stand up just so you can kind of see what she looks like there. Um, and then our son, Calvin. And we also have a niece that lives with us, but she is uh, back in Mexico. So just was invited to say a few words about kind of what the, who we are and what the Lord's doing with us. And uh, so uh, we've been married 17 and a half years, and it's been working out pretty good so far. Um, the, uh, I know a lot of pastors and missionaries, um, they have a wife that loves them, and they're kind of willing to go along for the ride, as it were. Uh, but I've been very blessed with the fact that my wife was actually working in church planning even before she met me. So that was actually written into the DNA of our relationship uh, before we even got started. So that's been a big uh, blessing for me. Um, so we... Many years ago, I've lived in Mexico now for over half of my adult life, and so when we decided that when we felt the Lord's call to go serve him in, in a church, but we knew it was going to be somewhere in Latin America, this was back in 2010, uh, we have a 1977 VW Hippie van, uh, and this poor young woman uh, lived with me in a van for 11 months. And we traveled all the way from Dallas, Texas, down into the southern tip of South America, uh, and we saw 17 different, or 15 different missions, no. 17 different missions in 15 different countries um, on the way down there just to see what the Lord uh, would have for us. We ended up in Guadalajara, uh, and that's where we've been for the last uh, 14 years now. Uh, when we got there, I was called to serve a larger church, and so we did that for quite a while. But then right around the pandemic in 2020, uh, we were called to plant a church, and it's called the E412 Project. I know that sounds really weird for a church, but it's for Ephesians 412, which says that the role of the pastor is to equip all of the saints for the work of ministry. And that was really important to us, that we really wanted to, I mean, so much of the joy in the Christian life comes, and we're not just sitting and listening. I mean, that part is important, being fed by the Word of God and, and, and growing, but then turning around and using what we've learned to serve Him and to advance His kingdom. And so we wanted to personally disciple as many people as possible in the church and equip them for whatever ministry that the Lord would have for them. And so that's what we've been doing uh, these last years, and the church is now getting to place where they're ready. We, said we always wanted from the time that we planted the church to eventually hand it over to local leadership and so that they would continue the work there. And they've, we knew about at the beginning of this year that, that they were ready. Um, and so it's kind of like your kids going off to college, you love them and you want to kind of stay with them and, and hold them, but you know, you have to release them into the world and to set them on their, on the course that their life is going to take. And so that's where the little church down there is. And so now we're looking just to see wherever the Lord uh, would have for us. And so that's what we're doing here. To tell you just a couple of stories, I'll just wrap up with a couple of stories about just literally things that have happened in the last couple of weeks there uh, down in Mexico. Um, one of them is just about two and a half weeks ago. Um, a couple of young ladies are in their early 30s, and they're married with kids. And they just came up to me and they said, hey, we have a couple of young ladies in our church from about 16 to about 22, 23. And, and some of them are still kind of wandering life, trying to figure things out. And we would really love to to start a discipleship group with them to begin to disciple. We're, we ver feel very strongly that uh, since the church is a discipleship community, Jesus modeled discipleship ministry, and then at the very end, he gathered all of his disciples and taught them how to make other disciples. And so that's a thing that we've really strongly focused in developing a culture of discipleship there in the church. And so they, nobody asked these two young ladies to do this, but they said, we just really have a heart for the young women of our church. Can we start uh, a discipleship, uh, Bible study discipleship group for the young ladies? I was like, oh man, that's great. How can I help you? How can we equip you uh, to do that? And so that's been going on for a couple of weeks now, just freshly started. Um, and one of the most precious stories uh, very recently of discipleship in our church is there's a, there's a guy named Marco in our church, and he loves Jesus, and he loves the Word of God, and he loves sharing the Word of God with other people, and he's got a little bit of a stutter. Uh, so he, he doesn't talk very eloquently all the time, and, and so he thought, well, I can never be the one to share. You know, other people have to do that. I can't do that. But, but really, the way he explains the Word of God is, is really beautiful, and so, so I've, I've really encouraged him over the years to begin to develop those gifts, and he began about a year, year and a half ago to host a Bible study in his home. And so he's been, I've been helping him, sometimes I'll teach it, sometimes he'll teach it, and he's been really growing in that area. 
And one of the people that he's really had a heart for was a guy named Alejandro. And Alejandro is a very worldly guy. I mean, he's just a businessman. He's never been religious. He's never gone to church. He doesn't care anything about any of that kind of stuff. He's just kind of out there in the world. And Marco's really been reaching out to him. And the uh, Marco finally got up the nerve to invite him to the Bible study. He's like, just come and kind of check it out. And so the guy's like, all right, we're friends. And so he came to the Bible study, uh, and he's been coming to the Bible study ever since. I mean, for he is asking great questions. He's, he's really learning. And then, then Mark was like, well, if you like the Bible study, maybe you should come to church. And then he started coming to church and um, really has been been growing. He's like, well, can you meet with me and tell me more? And he meets with Marco and he meets with me. And, and he's really, Marco's really been discipling him through the process. Well, about three weeks ago, I think it was about three weeks ago, um, this guy plays uh, racquetball. I mean, it's kind of his, this Alejandro guy. He plays racquetball. It's just kind of his thing. And he was out playing racquetball and, and he fell down. And he got up and he was playing racquetball and he fell down again. And he's like, something is wrong. I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but something's wrong with me. So he's like, I'll just go check out and see the doctor uh, what's wrong. Turned out he had a brain tumor. Um, and the, they were like, okay, well, we need, to, we need to do a surgery on you right away. And so his surgery was like a week ago, about 12 days ago, something like that. So about 12 days ago, they said, no, this is, this is serious. You need to get a, a surgery. This is pressing on certain parts of your brain and your optic nerve and stuff. And so he got a surgery. And he... Uh, Got through the surgery, looked really emaciated, you know what I mean? He had his head was shaved, he had a huge scar on his head. Two days later on Sunday, he's at church. And I'm like, whoa, what are you doing here? You know what I mean? I thought you would take at least a couple of weeks off. I mean, he was in, he was pretty much couldn't walk. People had to help him like in there. But he was in church and I was like, I mean, you didn't have to come today, you know what I mean? You could stay home. Um, and he said, but the word of God is here. That's, that's where it is. It's like, whoa, 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 okay. So anyway, um, so he was there at church, um, and a couple days later he died. Um, he wasn't part of the church for very long. Um, but he's going to be part of the church forever. And, and if I can encourage you, you never know. Um, none of us are part of the church for very long. We like to think life is long, and we like to think that it's, you know, that we're all going to be here forever, and we're going to see our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids. And, um, but the Lord will call people to himself when he wants. Um, and so the time is short, and we have such a beautiful opportunity to, to reach people and extend to his kingdom. Uh, and we'll get to see... Alejandro forever, uh, because Marco, a guy who had a stutter and didn't think he would ever be able to disciple anybody or share the gospel or teach the word, um, was faithful. Um, and so that's, that's really what the E412 project was all about, um, was helping people and equipping them to be able to disciple other people and to be able to reach them for the kingdom. And so um, just would encourage you, even if you think, oh, I mean, that's kind of not my thing. I don't, I'm not sure I could do anything for the kingdom. I'm not sure, you know, I don't, I don't really feel equipped or I don't, I don't really feel like there's anything that I can do. Um, trust me, God has gifted you beyond what you can imagine. Um, there are many gifts that each one of you has, and God has a ministry for you, and he's called you to fulfill that part in his kingdom. Um, and it'll be different for everybody, um, but, but search for that. Search for that. It's, it's one of the most exciting, rewarding, fulfilling things you could possibly do as a human being uh, is participate actively in his kingdom. And so I would warmly encourage you to all uh, look for that, for whatever the Lord would have for you, um, and because, because he is worthy. Um, he is worthy. So anyway, it was, it's lovely uh, getting to see all of your faces, and hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit uh, later um, after, the, after the service. Just lay it down here. Yep. Thank you, Thomas. That's an uplifting, an uplifting uh, testimonial Thomas shared with us over the weekend. Our leaders spent quite a bit of time together with he and Sandra and had, had you all in our house last night. That was fantastic. So, you know, today, today we are going to uh, begin a series of messages in the book of James. If you care to turn there with me, just some thoughts about that, uh, even just springboarding on what was just shared here. And, in, and before that, Rod was sharing a, a, seri- a list of needs and um, 
people are hurting, sick, in the hospital, uh, troubling times uh, we face. Um, as we look at the letter to James, we're going to begin this series and kind of came to think about this entire series generally being themed under the heading of living proof, living proof. And as we go through this, this book of the Bible, the letter of James, we're going to find out how practical uh, this book, in fact, is. Uh, it is far more than just a, another book of theological truths, although it certainly is that. And uh, theology is, is practical in nature. And James is perhaps one of the more practical books in the New Testament, certainly. Some have even likened it to uh, the Proverbs, the pithy statements of the, pro the Proverbs and so forth. So as we go along through this study over the, the next few months, actually, uh, we'll find how uh, practical are the thoughts that we find here in, in James, the book of James. And this, this, this message this morning, first of all, is, is entitled, Tested, Tried, and Triumphant. Tested, tried, and triumphant. So if you would, please join me this morning as we now look here to the, to the letter of James. And the first four verses, we're going to just center our focus this morning just on the first opening four verses of this letter. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, in everything, and nothing, rather, lacking in nothing. Alistair Begg makes this remark um, in, in re reference to the letter of James. He says, the epistle of James addresses a universally relevant question, and that is, how are God's people to live in God's world? How are God's people to live in God's world? This side of heaven, trials and tribulations crowd into our lives, he said, confronting us with failure and tears and tribulations and doubts, and disappointments, and sorrow, and groanings. In response, he said, James offers us a practical help with an eye toward not becoming Christians so much as behaving as those who have been redeemed, end quote. So again, this, this letter is not so much uh, a, a textbook about how to become a follower of Jesus. It is written, as we see here in that very first verse, to the 12 tribes, as he says here, the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Now, we know that clear back in the you know, centuries before the time of Christ, the, after the time of, first of all, the Assyrian captivity that took away the, tw the, t the 10 tribes, the northern tribes, into, by the Assyrians. And after that, about a century or so, the Babylonian uh, Empire besieged and laid siege to Jerusalem. And there was a 70-year uh, time of taking the people of Judah and and Benjamin away, uh, the, the southern tribes into captivity for 70 years as a punishment. So during that time, and even in the days of Esther, you remember the story of Esther in the Old Testament, when, when Cyrus became king of Persia, we know that he, he, he was moved by God to send, allow the people of Israel, who were under, still in captivity then, now under the domain of, of uh, Persia, um, to go back and rebuild. And so you find the stories, of course, of Nehemiah, Esther, uh, Ezra, the, pro the uh, scribe, and so forth and during that time. And so many Jews returned to their homeland, and they rebuilt under the guidance and direction of Nehemiah, the, the second temple. And, but there were many who remained in those places, and even over the following centuries of time, nearly five and a half to six centuries of total time, the, the Jewish people remained dispersed. But when James begins to speak here, and he uses this word, the dispersion, which you notice is a proper noun, it's in capitalized form, he's talking about something that happened immediately following the, re the, the birth of the church. And if you care to, you can turn with me. We're going to look at two passages that come out of the book of Acts. First of all, Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, where we find a reference 
particularly to the dispersion. Acts chapter 8, 1, it says, And Saul approved of Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered, that word being dispersion. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He had dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And of course we find there then the story of Philip going to Samaria. If you move over to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11 verse 19 we pick up the, the, the story of the, of the church. Acts chapter eleven nineteen 19 says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed... Turn to the Lord. And so James is writing to the 12 tribes. That's a, that's a reference particularly to Jewish believers. And in, the, in Peter's first letter, there's yet another kind of a reference as well to the dispersion. Peter begins his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, writing, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. And so we see the, this reference to the scattering of the people of God. The, and, and Peter inserts this idea of the foreknowledge of God. So clearly the inference is that God is in control, that God had a, had a plan that was through that dispersion at work. Uh, and the Jewish Christians began to be dispersed literally throughout the entirety of the Roman Empire. And along with them, they took the gospel's message. People like, men like Philip and others were sent out abroad. And so we see here the, the impact, and this is really important as we consider this whole theme of understanding the various trials that are besetting in, in, our, in our lives. And, and that is that God in his sovereign wisdom, according to his purpose and his plan had actually orchestrated the dispersion of the Christians who then settled in various new places throughout the empire, cities in which churches were then to finally established, many of whom came to be established under the ministry of the Apostle Paul and his ministry to the, to the Gentiles particularly. And so James here is writing to encourage the believers not to forsake their faith, but rather to remain steadfast in their faith, knowing that God was at work in their lives. And I'd like to set forth a, a principle that's going to guide our thoughts here this morning as we move ahead, and that's this. It is in recognizing, accepting, and yielding to God's sovereign providence that we can then live triumphant lives that bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. It is in recognizing ourselves and accepting and yielding to God's sovereign providence that we can then leave, live triumphant lives that bring glory and honor to Jesus. So as we look at these verses, 2, 3, and 4, I'm going to lift out three particular things, elements, points along the way. The first one is this, the source of our joy gives us strength in the trials. Now James writes it this way, he says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow believers, we could say, when you meet trials of various kinds. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. John 15, 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you 
meet trials of various kinds, and I believe he's referring to the, the source of our joy that gives the believer strength to face the trials of life. And I like J.B. Phillips' uh, paraphrase of this text, and he writes this, and, and, then, and this is how he translates verse 2, J.B. Phillips. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Welcome them as friends. So let's, let's think about the trials. Now, we heard several of them listed today. I would dare say that Alejandro's loved ones and family, friends, that is a, a trial that they never thought would happen. I mean, and it's recent. It's very recent. Uh, Sam and Doris, Michael, I mean, Dol- Dolores and Michael Bingham and others. I mean, many of our friends, what Pete, Pete is going through right now. I mean, you, the list goes on and on and on, right? And we think about the various trials, uh, uh, one such as a, a prolonged illness or even a, a terminal diagnosis, uh, the death of a loved one. Uh, the loss of your job or the betrayal of a friend that you thought you could always trust. Or perhaps even the trial of chronic pain that just won't go away. Or uh, a failed surgery that, that unfortunately you need to go back in and have it be redone. And that the enduring uh, length of that time. And how about this? Infidelity in your marriage relationship. That's a trial of a different kind. The trial of not being certain whether you're, you, you can have children for a young couple that desperately would love to have a family of their own. And so that, that whole thing, it's a, it's a trial. And so I believe James is, a, is, is looking at these things. And he says, when you meet trials of various kinds. And so how are we supposed to make sense of this verse, this text? This first, the second verse of James chapter, we just started, well, just shrug it off, you know. You know, get over it. No, that, that's not at all. I don't believe at all the heart of James. James is not trivializing your pain. He's not trivializing pain and suffering. He, he, he's saying what really we all know to be true, and that is this. When you go through trials, which we will, no matter what shape or form they may take, as Phillips puts it, don't resent them as intruders in your life. Know that the Lord God is working through and in those trials for what? For the purpose of his, his glory and your good. Romans eight twenty eight. He's working all things together for the good of those who love him and have been called together for his purpose. You know, we like to, we like to simplify that and almost make that verse like a cliche of our faith. But there's, there's, a, there's a deep, sub, substantial truth that's rooted in that verse. That assures us that God is working, that the hand of God is upon your life, even in that most desperate, difficult, seemingly endless season of life that is a trial of one sort or another. Thank God for that trial and rejoice in that trial. You know, as I was thinking about that particular idea and thought, my thoughts went back to Paul's letter to the Philippian church. We, We were in Philippians last week. Uh, and, and I just was thinking about, thinking about this, this, this passage in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. Of course, Paul is writing from the prison in Rome, and he's writing here, and he's talking about in Philippians chapter 1, the uh, beginning in verse 17 and down, he's talking about those who are preaching Christ from envy and rivalry, but some are preaching out from goodwill. He says, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm here, but for the defense of the gospel. Verse 17, but the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment, a various trial, right? A trial of various kinds. What then, he says, well, that only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that, I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that in, with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he goes on in chapter 4, of course, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. He's in prison. He's in prison at the end of his life. 
And Paul's rejoicing. How? Because he was drawing his strength and his joy from the source of our joy. Right? The indwelling spirit of Jesus is the source of the, of the believer's joy. And that joy doesn't dissipate simply because you're facing a hard thing. That joy, I believe, is, it actually arises and is galvanized even more so when we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wondrous face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim, the writer says of that hymn, in the light of his glory and his grace. His unconquerable joy strengthens us in every single season of life that we're going through. And in any trial that God permits us, permits you to go through. The permissive will of God. No matter what trial or situation we may be facing today in your life, maybe you're the only one that knows. But I can assure you God knows what's happening in your life Maybe the person right next to you seated here, seated here this morning doesn't have a clue what you're, what's on your heart today. But I can assure you the Lord God does know. And no matter what trial or situation that's difficult that you are facing today, maybe only known to yourself, know this, that the Lord has permitted that trial in your life. Why? So that his power and his glory will be on display through you as you trust in him. As you trust in the Lord. Perhaps you're familiar with Paul's words as he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Speaking about this thorn in the flesh. This messenger of Satan he, that, that was sent to harass him. He says there in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 8. He says, he says of that. He says three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. That it should leave me. But he said to me my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, Paul said, so that in the that power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am co content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Strong in his own ability, strong in Paul's own uh, resilience, strong because, well, he's the Apostle Paul and he's on some other echelon. No, he found his strength in the very one in whom you can find strength, in whom we in Jesus Christ find our strength. You know where that is? The Lord Jesus, resting in him, confident in him, residing in him. Our lives are meant to show forth the living proof of Jesus Christ. And it is in recognizing, accepting, and then yielding to God's sovereign providence that we can then live triumphant lives that bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. And friends, that is why we're here. <laughs> Amen? That is the apex of everything. We're, that's the pinnacle that we're shooting for, striving for, desiring after. To honor Christ in everything. The source of our joy gives us strength in the trials. And the second point that we find as referenced in verse 3 is that the genuineness of our faith is proven in the fire. For you know that the testing of your faith, verse 3, produces steadfastness. And again, let me just read J.B. Phillips' paraphrase of those two verses together. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Verse 3, realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. The quality of endurance. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul makes a reference to the affliction of these believers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, and 5, he says, Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. I think it has a direct bearing on this very, this very point of understanding what God is doing in our lives and why. 
God is at work. He, he allows, He permits the trials and the tests and even the suffering of affliction, the loss of a loved one, any and every one of those things, to accomplish something in the life of the believer that I truly believe can only be realized and experientially learned through the source of that. Yesterday, Thomas and I were talking for quite a while and sharing some of the, the story of our own pastoral ministries over the last few years. And we both realized that despite some of the hard things that we've had to endure as a couple, not just he and I, right, Sandra and Lori, right? Our wives are with us in those times, and we look back on that, and in a way, we, we, it's sad, it's hard to think about it, but in another sense, I, I probably wouldn't change it out because in the midst of those hard things, God is teaching us something about ourselves and about him that we could only learn that way. It's like the story of Job all over again. Listen to the, to the way that the writer to the Hebrews describes the people of faith. This is in Hebrews chapter 11, if you care to look there with me. Hebrews chapter 11, the, 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 the great chapter of the hall, the, the hall of fame of faith, if you want to think of it that way. I'm going to pick it up in verse 32, Hebrews eleven thirty-two. And what more shall we say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should be not, not be made perfect. Of course, that idea is looking beyond this life. It's looking to the perfection that will one day be uh, uh, fulfilled at the coming of Christ. The genuineness of our faith is proven in the fire. Again, remember, the letter of James was written to address the practical faith of Christians living in a very trying and real circumstance of life that was difficult. He was not just writing to enlarge their or our theological encyclopedia of knowledge about God. James wants us to take what we know about God through his word and apply it to the pressing challenges that believers are facing all over the world. Not just the persecuted church, but believers like you and me, believers that we know, even, even ourselves. The man Derek Prime was quoted as this. He said, trouble, hardship, and various forms of suffering come to us all at some or time or another. The natural tendency may be to feel that such things are a waste of human life and to be avoided at all costs. And then he says, our knowledge of God, in other words, our theology, informs us otherwise. And so here in verse 3, James says, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. How many of you find, have ever found yourself in a difficult time and in your, like you know, like we know what we should think. We know what we should understand. We know, we, you know, we don't doubt what we, we know, but somehow our feelings rise up and want to lay hold of and take control of and trump what we know. We know what, what we know to be true should trump the feelings and not the other way around. If you're led by your feelings, then that things can run amok. But remember what Paul said in his letter to the Colossians. He said, set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on that. You see, faith by itself does not develop steadfastness and endurance. It is only when faith is tested, put to the test, that it is 
being refined as gold in the fire, and it produces steadfastness. Indeed, that's the, the very point made by Paul, Peter, the apostle, in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, again, on this time down in verse 6 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 6. Peter says, speaking of our, the, the, the beauty, wonder, and, fan, and of our internal inheritance, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the goal, the salvation of your souls. Of course, he goes on later in chapter 4 here, 1 Peter four twelve, to say, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He's speaking about the, the consummation of this. When Jesus comes back in power and great glory. That's the reference that James is making. That's the reference that Peter is citing there. You know, oftentimes the trials of life we experience are, are certainly not momentary. We know that. They're, they're long-lasting. They feel like they're never going to, going to end. Why is that? Who, who determines the, the boundary of the test in time? How long is it going to be, right? I believe that the length and the duration of the test, the trials, are given so that to test the, well, we can think of the, the tensile strength of the genuineness of our faith, even as the metal can be tested in that way, the tensile strength. The longer that it's, that, that it's being refined and prepared strengthens it. Things such as a, a long-awaited, much-desired pregnancy that suddenly and sadly ends in a miscarriage. And that's sad. And that hurts. And that brings grief. And we want to say, why, Lord? Why, God? Why? A spouse's terminal illness is diagnosed and suddenly that overtakes our lives and we want to say why we cry out to the Lord these are the kinds of fiery tests of faith that we're sp focusing on today and I, I think they're, they're they're not only real they hit the mark of the question to bear at, bear at hand here today and that is this when the tests of life come and we may think will I still trust in the Lord and then I truly believe that genuine faith, listen, genuine faith is always purified in the fiery trials of life that God permits for his good, for your good rather, and his glory. That's why he allows them. God is working purposefully to accomplish those things. The genuineness of our faith is proven in the fire. And one last point we could look at as we consider verse 4, and that is, the outcome of our faith aims for heaven's glory. The outcome of our faith, verse 4, And yet, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That you may be perfect and complete, mature. That word perfect and complete is the word teleoi in Greek, okay? That speaks of, again, the, the consummation of all things. How many of you would be able to recite with me Philippians 1.6? He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it to the day of Jesus Christ, right? Same thing. He'll be faithful. So who's at work? The Lord Jesus. God's at work in our lives, and he's doing so. You're, you're, not, you're unfinished. If you're still walking and living and breathing, as we are, I think, you know, yeah. God's still not done with you. You're an unfinished work, but you're a work in progress, as am I. Again, look, let's listen to J.B. Phillips one last time. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, 
Don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. And realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on, verse 4, until that endurance is fully developed. And you will find you have become men of mature character. Men of mature character. That's what God wants to do in our lives. And he uses the trials of life to accomplish it. Let's look back at one, one, one last time at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 this time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, some well-known words. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Paul writes, but we have this treasure, treasure of the, the knowledge of the, of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Verse 16, and so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our physical bodies, we could say, our inner self, our spiritual body, our spiritual life, the true us in Jesus, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Friends, I'm here to tell you that we are living for an eternity that yet to come. And if we keep our eyes on Christ as we go along through this life, even as Paul did, we will find that we are able to rise above the difficulties that often weigh less in this life. Paul, the apostle, had a remarkable God-given ability to do that, didn't he? An ability to view all of the hardships. I mean, this man went through terrible affliction and suffering for the sake of Christ, the trials, the suffering for Jesus. But he saw through those by means of the lens of eternity rather than just simply seeing them through the what I call the, the, the keyhole of our current life and situation that we only see a little bit. That myopic spiritual view, if you will, the narrow view. Not seeing everything as God does. But here's the thing, that eternal perspective, as Paul wrote there, is the key to living triumphantly by faith. Despite the crucible of suffering, the various trials and the temptations that we will face in our lives from time to time. And again, one last time, as we look back just a couple of verses once again from Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, at the people of faith. Listen how they set as an example to follow. Hebrews eleven thirteen. All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And I dare say he has prepared that city for the believer today. If you're in Jesus Christ, there is a homeland awaiting. We are just pilgrims passing through right now. God is at work in you, as Paul writes in Philippians, both to will and to work to accomplish his good purpose. He's working in us to accomplish through the trials that he permits in life. All the things that he allows us to experience so that when the likeness of Christ can be fashioned, formed, and completed one day, even Jesus the Savior is made perfect in his suffering. I'm going to land with these couple of verses again from Hebrews, this time Hebrews 12. We're going to end here today. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, 
And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Friends, take, take, take heart. Be, be hopeful. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its perfect and full effect, so that you may be complete, perfect, and lacking in nothing. It is in, rec- in recognizing, accepting, and yielding to God's sovereign providence that we can then live triumphant lives that bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. This is not within our physical human capacity, but it is in the, the power of God, working in the people of God. And when we strive for those things, guess what happens? We become the living proof to a watching world against the backdrop of darkness all around us in this place. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer.